Oh, it even says now. So today's Dharma talk, the Buddha gave up. Before we get into the breadth and depth of Zen, it's good to know that this is a living lineage that goes back all the way 2,500 years ago to the founder, the Buddha. I'm just one of a long line of masters that have happened to appear to share the Dharma, to share the truth with you. I appeared because of you. One of many people who have followed this ancient way and have received mind-to-mind -mind transmission. So we look back and we see that the Buddha was the first master and teacher of our tradition. Buddha really is nothing other than mind and mind is nothing other than Buddha. The person that most people associate with the name Buddha is a person named Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha's story of awakening is our story of awakening. So there was Siddhartha 2,500 years ago and his life was good and going in a certain direction. And then something happened that rocked him to the core. Something that upset him and turned his perfect life upside down. And that made him go off in search of truth to help him find peace, happiness, and wisdom. With the Buddha, he not only wanted that for himself, but he wanted that for all beings. This is very important. It's good, it's good that you wanna find happiness, peace, wisdom for yourself, but truly, truly the expedient, truly the thing that's gonna propel this forward is that you have a wish for awakening, not only for yourself, but for the benefit of all beings. So when we come together, I want you to really generate that idea for the benefit of, I will awaken, not only for my benefit, but for the benefit of all beings. Because the greatest gift that we can give society, to give our loved ones, to give friends and family, to give strangers on the street, is us, awaken. Simple, simple. So something rocked him to his core and set him off on this journey to find truth. And maybe this is what has happened to us too. Maybe something has upset our lives in such a way, turned it upside down, tossed us about. Our lives were going in a certain direction and then something happened to make us go in search of truth. For Siddhartha, he saw three things that he had never seen before. Sickness, old age, and death. These are big truths of life that affect each and every one of us in some way. He saw people struggling to be happy and he discovered that he too wasn't happy. Even though he had everything that the world said should make us happy. He had riches, he had fame, he had all that he desired, but he still, still wasn't truly happy. So he went off in search of some way or method to help ease not only his suffering and bring himself happiness, but to do that as well for other beings. And for years, he tried everything out there, everything. If he lived today, he would have tried things like Reiki and affirmations and breath work and Pilates. He would have done it all. He would have done it all because he did everything, everything that was available to, available to him back then. And still, he wasn't happy. And still, he couldn't find the peace and tranquility that he was looking for. So, so what did he do? He went to extremes then. He pushed himself even harder. And he took up this form of like hardcore asceticism. I think I said that right just like hardcore practices that sort of looked at the body almost like the enemy, right? His body, his body withered away to nothing. And he eventually, he looked like the walking dead. It's like you could see his rib cage and like his, his spinal cord through his belly. It was gross. And there was even one time he had been lying down on the side of the road and people that were walking by, like he was so exhausted. He had nothing, no gas in the tank. He's just lying there and people walking by, it thought he was dead. That's how emaciated he looked just from pushing himself so hard. And sort of like us, we do that too, you know? We do that too. They thought he was dead. 
there was one day during this time period that the Buddha, he waded into a pond, I guess maybe to get away from the Indian heat or maybe to wash himself or something like this. But he was, because he was so weak and so decrepit, he almost died in that pond. He almost drowned because he couldn't, he didn't have the strength to pull himself out of the water. So finally, he finally pulled himself out and lying there on the back, on the bank of that water, lying there in the mud, gasping for breath. He did something inconceivable for the Buddha because the Buddha was a master of everything. Anything that he did, he mastered. But here he was, he, he almost dead. He almost died in this water, just from a simple, just going into the water. So he's sitting there, he's covered in mud, gasping for breath, and he did something unfathomable. He gave up. He just, he stopped trying. Here he was fighting to breathe, covered in mud, years. He had been doing this for years. Years of his life had gone by and still he hadn't found a way to be happy and free. Just like us with all the books and all the courses and everything that we do and take. So he dragged himself out of the mud, crawled his way to the foot of a tree and then propped his hunger stricken body up against it. Just breathe in. And I imagine for me, I like to imagine this moment. And I, like, I think at that moment, the Buddha cried because he had been pushing and pushing and pushing so hard. He was so desperate to be happy. He was so desperate to be free. And he still wasn't. After all this, all this stuff. So for me, I imagine that he probably was crying and he was upset. And at the end of it, like, what am I supposed to do? There's got to be another way, he muttered to himself. There's got to be. Even though he tried everything, he's, there's got to be another way. A way that was gentle and easy, that didn't ravage his body. A way to no longer by tor to be tormented by his mind. There had to be another way. And as, as he was crumpled up against that tree, a memory flashed in his mind. It was when he was a boy. And probably... He had this vision of himself, this memory of himself as a boy sitting underneath the tree on a, on a night, like the nights that we're having right now. But during the day, you know how it's like the sun is shining and it's a cool breeze and it's still warm. It's beautiful. It's perfect. The weather's perfect. Yeah. So he had this memory. You can feel it, right? You felt it over the last week or so, if you happen to have some sun on your skin, the breeze. So he had this memory of himself as a boy. He's a prince, right? So he used to get, you know, all these people around him were taking care of him and, you know, waiting on him hand and foot and always, are you okay, prince? Everything you need, prince? Everything like this. But this one instance on this one day, on this fall afternoon, all the people that usually watch him left him alone to go watch the ceremony that was happening in the fields. And he was left alone that day, sitting underneath the tree, all by himself, with nothing to do. Warm sun, gentle breeze. And he had this memory. And he thought to himself, might this, might this be the way? It just seems so easy that he like, how weird, like I, he slipped and found, found it by accident as a boy. And intuitively he thought, yeah, I think this is it. Something inside of him said, yes. Something said for him to stop trying so hard to put it all down, to become natural, 
to eat when hungry, sleep when tired, and to stop chasing after enlightenment, to stop chasing after it. This non-doing is the opposite of everything he had tried before. This non-doing was the opposite of societal norms as well, even today, still to this day. It's all about doing, doing, doing. And if we say we're taking some time for ourselves, even if we say we're going to meditate, a lot of times we get met with friction. All society is all about striving, all about doing, doing, doing. And we, even today, we still believe that if we rest and are gentle with ourselves, then we're lazy, that this isn't the right way. So he stopped, he put it down and he sat. Luckily for him in this moment, a stranger came along and saw him sitting underneath the tree. She, this, la this lady thought that he was like a tree. He looked so ragged. If you ever see Buddha pictures of the Buddha from this time, he's just bag of bones and they usually have him dark brown. He almost looks like tree bark, right? So he was sitting there against the tree and this, this young woman saw him and she was coming to the tree to, to make offerings. And she thought he was a tree spirit. So she had brought a little bowl with porridge in it. And seeing Siddhartha there, she gave him the food. This is another thing. I like to imagine that first, because for years he was barely eating, maybe a grain of rice, a little bit of water. I like to imagine that first little wholesome bowl of porridge that he had. What that tasted like. Oh my God, it must have been delicious. Just to be there, eating that food for the first time and not, because before if he would have ate food, he would have criticized himself. He would have been judgmental with himself. He would have berated himself but not in this moment. And he ate that food. And slowly, he started to regain his strength. She made more offerings and he regained his strength even more. And he did the opposite of what he was doing before. He just sat and he sat and sat and deeper and deeper he went into the silence and deeper and deeper he started to discover that there was this natural deep refreshing calm within him just from sitting he became more and more relaxed more and more at ease in the moment and he sat and he sat and he sat deeper and deeper into that silent calm he went. And then eventually he started to discover this like natural joy and ease started to bubble up. His relaxation deepened, his ease deepened. And now there was this lighthearted joy and bliss that emerged just naturally, nothing generated. When we put everything down, life becomes very sensual, very blissful. I like to imagine this time as well with Siddhartha as he's got, getting his strength back. And I like to imagine him going through a walk through the forest during that time period. Just the movement of each footfall. Just at ease, nothing to do, nowhere to go just going for a stroll, the birds chirping, the sun on his skin, the breeze. I like to imagine this time as he starts, before everything was the enemy, everything was to be fought against. 
But the more, the deeper he sat, the more at ease he was, which meant that the more at ease he was in every moment. So I like to imagine during this time as well, just walking through the forest, each step, the rhythm of the body. Huh? Very beautiful. And still, he sat and sat and sat. And the raging currents of his mind subsided. And more and more, all that was left was this empty clarity. Perfectly still, crystal clear, just this mind free of attachment. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Then the natural Dharma started to become apparent to him. He saw how everything and everyone is bound together. Everything depended on everything else. Nothing had an independent inherent existence. Everything was bound to everything else. Everything needed something else in order to be. Everything interpenetrated everything else. This was a universal dharma. It was just there when he looked. A tree was no longer a tree. The tree was merely a conceptual designation. Tree, when he saw that shape and form, he saw how his mind would label it. And that if you looked long and deep enough at a tree, you would find sunshine, rain, earth, wind, time, mind, all of these things made up a tree. This was a universal dharma. He saw that hum to be human meant to be subject to a certain level of hardship. It was just a matter of fact. Life could be, and at times would be, hard. And a mind not at ease would make any situation even harder. When he had no mind, when he wasn't grasping, life was just what it was. No good, no bad. It just is. Sometimes pleasurable, sometimes painful, but pleasure and pain he saw was made up by the mind. As long as he didn't have like and dislike, he was free. And life and karma just unfolded naturally. This was a universal dharma that he saw. He saw everyone's karma unfolding, just unfolding like stories and characters. Everyone had a part to play. Everyone was bound to everyone else's journey, sometimes in big ways, sometimes in small ways but there seemed to be a unified field of experience that was constantly changing, 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 constantly evolving, stories intersecting other stories. Life was just unfolding. Cause and effect was continually in motion but not in a simple black and white kind of way. It was this complicated web of experience. As one thing rose, it brought up the other thing. As one thing faded, it brought the other thing down. Everything was just interconnected, bound together. And all of it leading, all of it leading to awakening. This was a universal dharma. He saw how even though he had a body, this body wasn't the true self. If it was the true self, he would be able to easily do away with headaches, stomach aches, right? Body, be skinny. It would just happen. But he didn't have any real control over the body. The body was never stable. 
It was always changing, changing, changing. And it was totally dependent on other things like water, food, shelter. So this body, this body couldn't be the true self. This was a universal dharma. He saw how feelings and emotions weren't the true self. They too were always arising and falling, changing, changing, changing. They too were dependently originated, bound to other things and situations. Feelings and emotions weren't the true self because they were always changing. This was a universal dharma. He saw this truth as well with perceptions and thoughts and memories. They too were always changing, 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 never staying the same. This was a universal dharma. He saw that even the sense of I, even the sense of I wasn't stable. It wasn't there all the time. That this I was a kind of fiction. How could there be an I, me, mine, if everything depended on everything else? Like tonight, I'm made up of salad and tofu. That's me today. And tea. <laughs> So even this sense of I, this feeling of I, it wasn't stable. It was there sometimes, sometimes it wasn't. This feeling of I wasn't the true self. This was a universal dharma. So he sat and sat and sat. And he put everything down. He thought to himself, what I'm looking for is the unchanging. And all of these things are changing all the time, bound to other things. So, so then what am I? And this, is, this what am I is a very important koan in Zen. This is the first koan I ever got, this what am I koan. What am I? And I chewed that koan years years. So the Buddha finally had to say, like, what am I? If I'm none of these things, if all of these things I took to be myself were merely processes of dependent origination going about their own way, what is the true self? What did he discover that never changed and wasn't affected by any of these changing things? Remember that crystal clarity and vivid wakefulness of mind we discovered in meditation? It was in that deep silence that he discovered the clear, empty radiance of mind. Looking into the empty clarity and stillness of mind, he said, all that remained was consciousness and equanimity, pure and bright. Consciousness without feature, without end, luminous all around. And he saw that these words could never really drive home the universal truth of awareness. They couldn't convey the open, empty field of awareness that he discovered behind it all. Behind all the changing dependent things, there was one thing that never changed. One thing that wasn't affected or dependent on anything else. Awareness was like space. After really seeing the truth, the Buddha said, how interesting that I and all beings are already awakened. <laughs> How would he be able to teach this to other people? Right? 
for days you we wondered about that. How am I supposed to explain this? <laughs> How was what the hell? Holy cow. He sat there for days. Days and days. And finally he thought to himself, okay. There might be a couple people out there that might get it. Because it has to be experienced. You can't be really told it. You can be pointed to it. Using the single word awareness as a pointer. You can be pointed toward it. But it has to be experienced. And that's the Buddhist tradition. That's Zen. It's really an invitation. Come. An invitation to discover truth for yourself. You are truth. <laughs> That's a crazy thing. Right? It's an invitation, a truth that is beyond every, anything that you ever imagined. And you'll laugh. You'll laugh your head off when it really clicks. And it's really, it's an invitation to discover your own Buddha nature, that you're a Buddha, that you're, <laughs> it's the craziest thing. You're a Buddha. You just don't know. And this is, the teachers are just there to invite you to that experience of awakening for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to sit, chew the koan. So really, this process is the process that thousands upon thousands of people have journeyed. It's a proven process. Proven. If, <laughs> if I can, you can. With all my delusions, right? Yeah. But you need to be committed. For me, one of the biggest benefits was that really fired up the practice, fired up my, my even to say journey and all this stuff is just a misnomer. But what's the wish? The wish to awaken, really. Not only for my benefit, but for the benefit of all beings, that I would awaken and that I would awaken everyone that I could. And that the greatest blessing that I could give my children, my partner, my family, my friends, strangers on the street, society as a whole was awakening. Because if we're awakened, society just changes. Everything just unfolds then, because it's working from this different place, this place of wisdom. And in our tradition as well, we hold all of all beings and we envision them not surviving, but really thriving. And this is another thing, right? To envision all the people in your life thriving. Thriving. And what would that look like as a society? Right? When we do our part, this is a, you're doing your part now by coming to these Dharma talks. If you chew the Quran, if you dedicate time to sit, rest in the radiance, see the empty clarity of mind more and more and more. Yeah, and it's this undoing, right? And then from that place of wakefulness, of wisdom, it then permeates out and touches everything and everyone because the foundation of everything and everyone is awakening. This is a crazy part too. The bedrock of being is this. 
Buddha nature. Right? So, that's the first Dharma talk. The Buddha gave up and sat and just saw these universal truths. Nothing special. Nothing holy about it whatsoever. Just vast emptiness. Wakefulness. Right? You guys want to sit? Let's sit. Let me end recording here.